So good afternoon. Um, my name is Blair Siegfried. Uh, I am the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education and Director of the Pennsylvania Experiment Station. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, be here today for our November College Connections webinar. Uh, these webinars are designed to give you a unique inside perspective of the diverse programs, people, priorities, and partnerships within the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. We are recording today's session, and you should be able to find this link and all past College Connection webinars on our college website by searching College Connections. And please note, it does take a few days for us to edit and post these recordings. So today's session is entitled A Walk in the Woods, A Look into Pi Private Forests in Pennsylvania and Beyond. And I'm joined today by Dr. Allison Muth, the director of the Jane C. Finley Center for Forests and an assistant research professor here in the college. After uh, Allison's presentation, we will have a Q&A session, first addressing those questions that were submitted during the registration. Um, but if you have questions during the presentation, um, please enter it into the Q&A link, not in the chat, uh, as it is easier for us to track, uh, track them there. So, But before we dive in, uh, let me take a minute to introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. Muth has been at Penn State since 2004 when she started working with the Pennsylvania Forest Stewards Volunteer Program and conducting outreach to forest landowners across the state and beyond. Today, she is an assistant professor and director of the James C. Finley Center for Private Forests, and she has worked in the forest industry and for private consulting firms and has a strong interest in peer learning and in creating dialogue to advance understanding of forest stewardship issues and opportunities. Allison has degrees in forestry and earned her doctorate in education with an emphasis in collaborative learning. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison and let her take it away. Great, Thanks, thanks. thanks so much. Thanks for having me and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm glad for the opportunity to share a bit about the James C. Finley Center for Private Forests and the work we're doing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to kind of take a high level uh, approach to this uh, and just uh, talk kind of the space we occupy, why we occupy that space, and then some of the um, insights that we're working to cultivate and expand upon kind of to influence our own work, to influence the work of the larger Penn State community, including Penn State Extension, and the work of many of our partners and stakeholders uh, out across the state, across the region, and across the nation. So um, with that, we're going to take a walk in Penn's woods. Uh, we're going to look at private forests, private forest landowners, um, and a little bit beyond that. So um, as I was structuring this uh, presentation, I was trying to kind of think about the space and how, how best to set the stage. And so I do want to start a little bit about what's out there, what our forest is. And, and a lot of this applies to much of the Eastern seaboard or as much of the Eastern US and the forest there. But I, I had a little caveat about kind of how foresters tend the woods because I wanted, I wanted you all to be aware of kind of the decisions that are going into that tending process or that management process. I'm going to share a little bit about what we've learned through recent studies about the larger landowner population and, and why we've been studying um, that audience and that group of people. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the space that we occupy. I like to say we work at the intersection of people and forests, and so hopefully I'm going to set us up a lot and then kind of the spaces and opportunities we've been able to get there. So let's kick off. Okay, Pennsylvania literally means Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania. Um, majority forested uh, land use in our state. So 58% of our state is forested. That equates to about 16.6 .6 million acres. A lot of forest out there. If you look at it historically, um, we have, we've been holding pretty steady in the last um, 80 years or so. Um, but we come back to the pre-colonial times uh, when only the Native American peoples, indigenous peoples were here. And the, the comments that were made were that essentially much of the Eastern US, most of Pennsylvania was all forested. Uh, 
uh, except for the rivers, except for the places that were burned for uh, the small cultivation that the indigenous people were doing. But relatively, the idea was that a squirrel could cross the state without ever having to touch the ground. People have heard that before, right? Um, so we held pretty steady through the early colonization. You can see where people started to cultivate the land to create their farms, and we see a decline in the estimation of the forest land cover. But really, our big impact on the forest resource happened between about 1819, 1890, sorry, and 1920. And that was the time of the Industrial Revolution. And so in that time period, we needed an energy source. And so that energy source came from the wood products. They uh, would cut down much of the forest, uh, burn it in charcoal pits and make charcoal. So a, a lightweight but highly efficient fuel that could then be shipped to um, the furnaces to turn iron ore, or to turn um, to smelt the iron ore and and you know start the industrial revolution all of that. So the idea was that most of the state was clear cut. We had most of the wood the trees removed in that time period. In that time period also, so we're we're harvesting a lot of the trees, we're using them. Um, we also essentially extirpated the deer population. There were very few deer, if any, left. There were a lot of fires raging across the open uh, landscape, lots of slash buildup from all those trees being cut down. Um, and uh, chestnut blight also came through at this time. So significant impacts um, on, the, on this resource. And so our forest has kind of been growing back from that time period. And so you can see from about 1965 on, We've held pretty steady in that 16, 16 and a half, 16 to 16.9 million acres remaining forested. Now we have areas where we are losing forests um, as, as places are developed. Once it goes concrete, it never goes back to forest. We're also gaining forests, maybe where old fields are reverting. So the, the losses kind of offset gains, but they are happening in different places. So, so just to kind of give you a sense of where we are. But the other key point of this is that because so much of the forest in, in the state in the Eastern US was um, harvested back at the turn of the 20th century, much of our forest is the same age. It's all, it all kind of grew back from that big event. And so that has implications on how we take care of it. So how does Pennsylvania compare? I've been alluding to the whole forest of the Eastern US and you can kind of see on this map, the green is private forest ownership in the you know, conterminous United States. Um, a lot of people assume much, because, I guess because we hear about the Western US and the public forest and the public lands out there, that when you're looking at forests in the East that those are likely publicly owned and that is just not the case. You can see from this map that we're dealing with a lot of private ownership. We do have public forests, and I'm going to go into that breakdown a little bit. But um, in so in the east, we are predominantly privately owned forests, which is why we are working in that space and trying to influence uh, how how things happen. Um, you think about where that forest is here in the east, and you think about where our major metropolitan areas are, and so our eastern forests are subject to a lot of people pressure. Right, um, there's a lot of big urban centers in the Eastern US and um, their proximity to our forests uh, does drive a lot of decisions uh, that are happening on those forests, those private lands. Um, we also have a lot of challenges to the forest, unfortunately. Um, and so these are all things that are affecting the natural processes, the um, expectations for what's gonna grow back if, if a harvest happens or an ice storm comes through or a tornado or straight line winds come through, how things are gonna grow back. And the challenge we're facing right now is that we have perturbed the system to an extent that things aren't responding like they used to. And, and that raises new challenges and, and kind of, I've, I've started to say it's almost, it used to be a responsibility to carefully manage the woods and now it's becoming almost an obligation. Things are things are kind of out of whack and, and need an intervention. So things like climate change, um, regardless of how where you attribute cause, um, we are seeing changes in weather patterns. We are seeing changes in rainfall patterns. We are seeing changes in uh, average winter uh, nighttime temperatures, which are driving some changes 
in what's happening in the landscape and how our trees can respond. Now, plants are very it's called plastic. They're very adaptable to their site and different growing conditions, but sometimes that that site changes to a degree that they're not as adaptable. And so the fear is that some of the changes attributed to climate change may um, override that natural plasticity. Um, invasive species. Pennsylvania seems to be ground zero <laughs> for a lot of invasives coming in, be it plants. Um, there's this uh, center picture is a picture of multiflora rose, um, which is a non-native species that comes in, has lovely big um, fruits that, and actually, no, this one was brought in by a game commission in order to create living fences. Yay, now it's taken off and takes over the forest and now it competes our native plants. So invasive plants, things that don't have natural competitors, those can become problematic. We're seeing insects, the big um, awareness around the spotted lanternfly. That's not impacting our forest as much, but you know, these there are many other things that that can. Uh, Blair and I were talking about the beech leaf disease that is coming in. Uh, it's a non-native disease being spread by nematodes, and so where did those nematodes come from? Where did the disease originate? I mentioned chestnut blight that knocked out the American chestnut at the turn of the 20th century. We've had others, other blights and fungal diseases come in. Um, oak anthracnose, oak wilt, or some that we're we're dealing with right now across the landscape. Um, so there's these non-native invasive species coming in are presenting challenges. Um, forest regeneration is proving challenging. We have, I, I said we've perturbed the system. We've also changed site conditions in many ways. And in some places, due to a combination of many things, some above in my list and some below in my list, the next forest is having trouble getting established. Um, we also have significant impacts from white-tailed deer. Uh, they are significant impacts on those young trees. Deer are uh, browsers, so they like to eat woody vege vegetation and our native young trees are preferred. Oh, those things are so yummy. So um, they, they um, tend to preferentially browse native species and certain native species. And so the, the high numbers of deer, which with the rut going on right now, we're seeing a lot of dead deer on the highways and roadways. Um, it gives you a good idea of how many deer are out there. Those, those deer have significant impact on the landscape. My lower picture here, um, this is a next to where the two people are standing. This is a deer fence, a deer exclosure. Inside the fence is to the left. Um, so that is, there are no deer in that forest. To the right of these folk, or their left, our right, this is where deer have been grazing or browsing on the woody vegetation. So this is the impact of, of deer on a forest. Um, all of these things are leading to declining species diversity. Um, and then we also have done things ourselves as we manipulate the resource for our uses. It is a resource. Um, we have changed the system to a degree. And so that has to be accounted for also. So I wanted to kind of talk about forest management. So this picture on the screen, the picture that I have behind me, because I wanted pretty trees behind me, this is um, the a shelter wood cut. So this is a type of forest management where their goal was to get the next forest established. They were trying to get young trees on the ground. And so for the species of trees that they were trying to get established, oak in this case, one of the things we have to think about, trees like all plants need four basic things. They need light, they need water, they need soil and nutrients, and they need a uh, air, carbon dioxide to take in, give us oxygen. And so the limiting factor here in the Eastern US is not often water. Um, it's not often soil nutrients. We have excellent soils, ample, ample air. Um, but what they need is what light becomes our limiting factor. And so for much of forest management, especially in the Eastern US, any type of management is all about controlling light. So this picture of a shelter wood is trying to get light on the forest floor to get the species that they want, in this case, oaks, which need about 50% sunlight back. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about forest management because we don't often draw these parallels. And so I'm, I'm gonna draw them for you all today. But when we think about forest management, the key thing that foresters have to think about and talk about is this idea of succession. And succession is the concept that different stages of forest follow each other over decades to centuries to millennia 
in the absence of other disturbance. So if you think about maybe an old field or you think about an area where forest used to be, um, often what you get in is grasses and forbs. It's usually the first thing that gets established. Um, you start to see over time, maybe annuals come in, then your biennials and then your perennials. And all of those plants coming in, maybe see a windblown seed coming in, they're changing the site. They're adding organic matter. They're changing the light. They're casting low shade. And then eventually woody vegetation comes in, uh, your shrubs. And, and over time, those conditions are changing. So eventually it would lead to a mature forest. And so for the Eastern US, kind of the uh, climax of succession is a mature forest. And so the idea of forest management is mimicking this natural process of succession. So we call this silviculture, not silver culture. This isn't about this isn't solely about economics, though that is a benefit. Silviculture is this process of management whereby you mimic natural succession and disturbance. So we're going to advance. We're going to speed things up, speed up the growth, concentrate growth on stems. We're going to slow things down. Maybe we want things to stay in a certain uh, stage of growth, or we're going to start it all over. So the idea is that we're using the um, ecology of the system. So the species that are there, their light requirements, their site requirements, um, and values of the owner, and all these things to try to think about the management actions to get to those goals. One of the key things that we talk a lot about is this idea that when we're managing forests to do it well, we have to focus on what's left rather than what's taken out. And um, sometimes that's a hard, uh, it's, a, it's just a bit of a mind shift, but it's that idea of ensuring that maybe the actions that you're taking and the reasons you're taking them will lead to conditions that are going to, in the long run, maybe take it in a more positive direct trajectory than potentially a negative trajectory. So that, that's what we're talking about with silviculture. So this is my, <laughs> this is my, a very crude graph about kind of this process. But if we're if we're looking at say a, a mown field and eventually we want to get it to old complex forests, you know, I've got 125 years for that to happen, maybe longer. But there are things we can do. So there have been a lot of efforts around planting trees. Well that would kind of lump over that or take it from mown field to old field, skip over old field and get us in the sapling shrub because oh yeah, now there's woody vegetation coming on or or maybe we have a lot of saplings and young trees, and so we want to concentrate growth on fewer stems to get those, get those up and uh, kind of create turning into poles sized trees. And so maybe we're gonna um, we're gonna go in, we're gonna pick which trees are gonna get the benefit of the site, get the benefit of the light and the resources that are there. So maybe we're doing a small crop tree release or a thinning, but there are things that we can do to kind of advance that process of growth, and those are forest management activities. We can also reset it. We can go into an older forest um, um, with maybe larger trees, hopefully diversity of species, and we can do practices that reset that. We can we can pull out, we can, in my example of the shelter wood, we could create conditions that let a young forest get established. So suddenly we're getting sapling shrubs underneath an older forest, but we've got we've got some, we've got a new, we've got the next generation coming in. So so the idea of forest management is this linkage to succession. And so this is this is something I really wanted to highlight. And I apologize for delving too deep in that, but I had, I had reason. But we think about that for all the reasons that we manage the forest. And so the why of management, we always say no tree wants to have, no tree is just begging to be cut down. There's no tree out there going, hey, pick me, pick me. Um, the idea is that we are managing our forest because of the values the owner be that state, federal, individual has for it. Um, and so those opportunities to manipulate things and change things are hopefully linking, linking to the values that people have for that property. And so um, things like recreation, you think about state forests or national forests, um, they are managing often there's some income there as they reset the forest and overstory removal were taken out the big trees, but they're also trying to think about recreational opportunities and they're thinking about view sheds. Uh, a lot of people are very interested in managing for habitat. Birds are a big thing people are talking about managing for. 
the if you look at the inventory of our total forest in eastern U.S., we have a whole lot of big old trees, but we don't have a lot of young, we call it early successional trees. So they're in those smaller areas. So now, now you have a context for that picture where, where the birds are getting all of the insects that they need to raise their young. And so, so for people who are talking about managing for birds, they're talking about creating more young forests and creating patchwork of forests. Income, forests are a resource. They're an economic resource. They're an ecological resource and a social resource. So income, uh, the t your child needs to go to college. This is a source of income. Um, a lot of people these days are talking about forest health and resilience, um, trying to improve conditions, leave it better when they found it. Carbon is a new thing on, in our in our in our world um, that people are talking about. Things like non-timber forest products. So all these things go into the why that we're doing why we're doing the manipulation. So let's talk about who owns Pennsylvania's forest. Uh, and I'm, I'm giving away my, my next slide by this one. So Pennsylvania, predominantly forest, predominantly privately owned. So 70% of our state's forest is privately owned. Um, the state, uh, so Game Commission and Bureau of Forestry own almost a quarter of the forest. Uh, local municipal, I know some towns have community forests, uh, school districts may have forests. That's only 3%. It's about 600,000 acres out of the 16.6 .6 million. Allegheny National Forest up in the northern part of the state is about 3%, so another 600,000. The other federal is things like the Flight 93 Memorial, Delaware Water Gap, Fort Indian Town Gap, um, other federal ownerships. So this 70% of private ownership includes people like you and me. It includes families and individuals, but it also includes um businesses, uh, corporations, sawmills that may have a wood a wood basket that they're pulling from. So this the to narrow down even further, about 55, still a majority of our forest ownership, but only 55% of it is non-corporate. So families, individuals. We've got to come up, we always dislike naming things by what it's not, but I didn't I didn't have a better way to parse that out at this point. I'll come up with a better word. Um, so, so we're dealing with a lot of individuals, a lot of families um, who are making decisions. This is my cheater slide, but just to give you a sense of comparison. So we are in the middle of a massive survey that we did of, of forest landowners in Pennsylvania. And we're looking at the national data and we're looking at our data um, and data that came before. So I took out my y-axis. You don't get to see my percentages. But what is happening across our landscape is we have a whole lot of people who own properties less than 10 acres in size. It's almost half a million based by between 350 and 500,000 people are owning properties less than 10 acres in size. But I'm not going to give you the exact number because um, I'm not there yet. But so we have a whole lot of people owning small properties. And then as the properties get larger, there are fewer and fewer owners. Um, but again, I'm not giving you the exact numbers because we're in the middle of data analysis and I'm not I'm not going to give away. I'm not going to give it all away yet. Um, but but yeah, and, and the challenge that we're facing is that this graph, as we look at it over consecutive years, that everything's shifting left. Um, everything is shifting towards those smaller and smaller classes. So you think back to where I started with the uh, percent of forest land in the state. Well, if we if that's holding steady and we've got potentially more and more people wanting to own forest and engage with it, how do they get their forest? Well, those larger properties could be broken up into smaller, which happens a lot. Um, we see it happen. We see it happen with old farms, with development coming in, uh, forests too. Things are moving. Um, so this is this is based on our most recent data. It's just kind of a distribution of properties across our landscape. So really, so the, the gray background is where maybe there's forest, but it's owned by someone else. So the up here in the uh, Northwest part of the state, there's Allegheny National Forest, the PA Wilds and the Bureau of Forestry, they own a lot of land up here. Um, so there's some, there's some missing forest places but then you can also start to see where forest is. So the lightest of the green is where you start to see properties that are bigger than 45 acres. Um, the greens are 45 and below with the lightest green being the smallest. You can see you know, where Pittsburgh is and how little forest is there. 
we didn't sample in Philadelphia County, but you can see where Bucks, Montgomery, and Delaware counties, you can see the extent of urban, you can see kind of the, um, what is that interstate, I-81 uh, corridor um, going uh, up through the Poconos and, and where Scrant Hazleton, Wilkesbury, and Scranton are. So you can kind of start to see where things are happening and where forest is in relation to but that distribution, those pressures, those small, those larger parcels are getting broken up. So we've been doing a lot of research about landowners. And so one of the things that we've been trying to figure out is who is, who is the average land, who is a landowner, a forest landowner? So our, um, our data, our, de our demographic data is kind of parallel to uh, rural Pennsylvania. Um, our woodland owner population is predominantly white. Um, it is predominantly male, though we have, like I just showed in the previous slide, we have started to parse it by size and there are more women owners, but they tend to own smaller properties. So about a third of the, in the smallest category, less than 10 acres are owned by women. The majority of those folks are retired. We've got an average age of 66, which is a little higher than it was the last several times we've done the survey. So we're trying to better understand that, that people are holding onto their land, potentially. Um, majority are retired, I already said that. Um, they own their land uh, in partnership with a spouse. 63% live on or within a mile of their land. About three quarters of them bought the property from someone else, but they have plans to pass it on to family, either one child, uh, one beneficiary or more than one beneficiary. Um, the majority, as I was saying earlier, our property is in properties less than 10 acres in size. But like with, with kind of um, accumulation of assets in order to purchase property, um, a majority of our, our owners are better educated than the average Pennsylvanian and tied to that higher levels of education is a higher household income. So they are slightly better off and um, maybe have on average, maybe more assets there. Um, so there's that connection. We've asked why they own their land and they own land to enjoy wildlife. That is the top reason people say they own their woodlands. Other people say it's about solitude or beauty, um, the, just the enjoyment of owning. I, I'm, I'm happy to know that I have it. What are they doing? Well, a lot of non-hunting recreation. They're hiking, they're bird watching, um, but they are also hunting. That was the second most common activity people did. The third most common was they're doing things to improve the habitat for wildlife. Maybe they're um, planting pollinator gardens or they're um, undertaking practices to improve habitat for birds, like I was mentioning earlier. Non-herbicide vegetation management, one of the big questions we always get is about um, invasive plants and how to manage them. And so we see a lot of people doing non-herbicide vegetation management. When we start getting kind of into the professional sphere and the space where resource professionals, the people we are and the people we are training in our student population, these are this is where we would be coming at this from our um, as as resource professionals hoping to advise and um, help people move their force in a better direction. Only five percent have a management plan, and and that's kind of a striking number because there have been huge investments and huge numbers of resources to help people get management plans written. Of those people who don't, so 95% of our landowner population who don't have a management plan, only 6% of them said they would. So there's maybe a hurdle there that we're trying to figure out how to address. A third of them have harvested their property, have har commercially harvested their property during their ownership. And we ask about you know factors that went into that decision and they talk about improving forest health, improving forest conditions, but they also talk about income. I said earlier, the forest is an ecological, a social, and an economic resource. And so a uh, child's uh, education, a retirement, another life event, sometimes that drives, um, that drives activities on the landscape. One of the things that we've been learning a lot about um, through our research and um, through our engagement is how important peers, family, friends, other landowners, are to that decision-making process. The importance of someone having experienced whatever activity the landowner's looking to do and the advice coming from someone who's someone like me, so a fellow landowner who has that credential of having done it. Um, when we ask about the kinds of harvests that have happened, 
you know, I, I started off talking about civil culture. Some based on some of the descriptions, it's it's possible that many of the actions that people are describing in this practice, in this third of the landowners who've done harvest, that could lead to unsustainable conditions in the future. We're not on the ground testing. We can't say for sure. We're only going by description. Um, the most recent U.S. Forest Service data says that about 28% of the private forests in Pennsylvania is in poor condition. So we may, I, I was talking about all of this threats to the forest. Um, now we're looking at the activities that could be adding to that. So, so yeah, that's kind of the setup for where we are. So I started off saying that the Finley Center works at the intersection of people and forest. And so we're, we're trying our best to understand the forest and we're trying our best to understand and help all those people who are trying to tend the forest to care. So I like to say we work at that intersection. Um, a little bit about the Dame C. Finley Center. So Jim Finley, who is no longer with us, he and I started the center back in 2011. And the reason we started the center was that we wanted to, we, we kind of recognize the foundational nature of, of this engagement of the private forest and the private forest landowner, upon which kind of a lot of other natural resources benefits uh, grow based on our predominant land use. And so we, so we started the center because we wanted to ensure a, f a continued focus on this space and in this place. Um, so, so in 2011, December of 2011, because I remember where we were when it happened, we got word that the provost had approved what was then the Center for Private Forest. Um, and, and it was what started us off in, in this journey. It built on Jim's decades of research, um, transdisciplinary research in this space and his engagement across a lot of different uh, subject matter areas and, and different level, different types of expertise and different types of engagement, all with a goal of advancing private forest landowners and private forest lands um, in larger conversations. Um, we lost Jim in 2021, um, and we're fortunate in April of 2022 to have the center renamed in his honor. So the center, we say we work at the intersection of people and forest. There it is again, I keep saying that. But our goal is to advance our research-based insights to inspire and cultivate stewardship of private forests. Um, to do so, we work in a space of basic and applied research, um, expanding understanding of landowners, their land, and the professionals who serve them. We're trying to inspire stewardship by um, growing this community of people who are making good decisions, who are making well-informed decisions that are leading their land into a more positive trajectory. We work to strengthen connections and really build this community, this larger community that we're working within um, and all the people who have a role to play. Um, we're trying to inform policy. We're trying to take our research into a space that helps those larger decision makers. Um, and 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 working to hopefully have a more positive impact. In this. We do a lot of applied research, basic and applied research, but the key things that we've been working on as of late, so I've alluded to our 2021 Forest Landowner Survey, and you got a teaser of some of that that's coming out, um, but we're really deeply trying to understand who folks are and how they're making decisions. Are there are there places we can help? Are there places where professionals can help? How do we connect with partners? Um, we spent a lot of time working in the space of legacy planning. Uh, we've now borrowed the University of Massachusetts term conservation-based estate planning, but this idea of helping woodland owners keep um, the largest intact parcel of, of natural land they can as it passes through generations. I talked earlier about how the um, the population of, and the parcels are increasingly getting uh, subdivided, bro broken down into smaller properties as more and more people own. We know that when land changes hands, that's when it's at risk. Um, that's when it's at risk of subdivision. That's when it's at risk potentially of a harvest that could lead to a negative outcome. Um, and so what we're trying to do in this space is help landowners prepare to engage the planning professionals. So we do a lot of work on communication. We do a lot of work on understanding the process, cultivating those resources based in our research to help advance that conversation and help advance that engagement. We've worked a lot with the um, conservation community, the conservancies and land trusts in, in the state and the region, uh, trying to think about how with a conservation expectation of land that's protected via a conservation easement, um, so, so it will never be subdivided, it'll never be developed. 
but how that expectation of engaging and managing the forest should be part of enhancing conservation values. And so cultivating those relationships and those educational resources based on our research. We do a lot around peer engagement of landowners, um, and I'll share a little bit more about that. And then in recent years, we've really been working to cultivate the community of forest professionals. Now in Pennsylvania, unlike other states, we are, it's, it's kind of uh, maybe opportunistic. We do not have licensure or registration of foresters. So, so anyone with could call themselves a forester and go out and practice. And so really trying to build this community where there are, there's um, cohesion and commitment um, in a space where there's no expectation or obligation uh, regulatory laws. And the big thing that we've been focused on a lot is the importance of relationships throughout. That's kind of become the underlying theme of my leadership is, is looking at those people, people, interpersonal relationships as part of all this, as our best opportunities for intervention. Um, some of the pieces I talked about peer engagement, we have a, um, a peer volunteer network, the Pennsylvania Forest Stewards, that's been around since 1991. And um, we've trained over 800 landowners who, after they go through the training, uh, much like master gardeners, which you might be familiar with, they go out and share the word about good forest stewardship with others. Um, in 2017, in attempts to kind of raise awareness about the forest, we started a, a group of people um, coming, a group of organizations coming together to have a statewide day of woods walks. And so over, since 2017, there have been hundreds of woods walks on the first Sunday in October um, across the state called Walk in Penn's Woods. Um, thousands of people have participated. In the last two years, we got a governor's proclamation about that this is the day, the first Sunday in October is uh, walk in Penswood. Uh, we do, we had our fifth biennial forest landowners conference um, in March of this year, hundreds of people coming out to learn and connect and network and find resources to help them care for their woods. We're also engaging the professional community. We're taking all that work that I've shared and, and a lot more that I didn't share um, and we're thinking about how do we cultivate the next generation of professionals? What kind of skills do they need? We're asking a lot of questions about practices and, and opportunities and, and where the evolution of our profession needs to go and, and how we can inform that. I mentioned our work with the Land Trust Land Conservancy community. We continue to engage with them and most recently help them get a grant to get management plans written for properties that have conservation easements on them. And then we've been uh, kind of acting as a convener for building this community of professionals around our privately owned forests and how they're cared for. Um, and so we've been working really hard in recent years to overcome some, some hurdles um, that have historically existed to try to find our common vision and find our common directionality so that we are working together. Um, you know, the challenge of the space is these are people we're not the boss of, and this is land we don't own. We can't regulate, we can't, we can't obligate, we can't do any of that stuff. But we can work to deeply understand, we can work to take that understanding and, and help create incentives and build partnerships, and we can educate to hopefully move people there, motivate people to act. But we're, we're trying to build that foundation to help others. So with that, I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna stop and ask for any questions. I have put our website up there. This is our marketing URL. So eco, we're in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management here in the College of Ag. Um, but this is how you can find us. You can find a lot of our resources and you can find, find me here and I'm welcome any questions. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing, Blair. Uh, thank you, Allison. A really nice presentation and uh, lots of really useful information. Um, so it is time for our Q&A session, and we will address questions submitted during the registration uh, period, and attendees can enter any of their questions into the Q&A uh, link at the bottom of the page, and we'll try to get them, get to them if, if we have enough time. So um, I'm going to start with uh, one of the submitted questions. And we'll go from there. So, Allison, I've heard the question is, I have heard you should cut down small trees in your forests and not the large ones um, so they can regenerate. And, and is there any truth to this to this comment? Okay. But yeah. So so 
these are always the hard questions because everything is so site dependent and condition dependent. So if you think about, if you go back to where I started with between 1890 and 1920, much of much of the forest was removed in Pennsylvania. That would mean that everything that grew back is about the same age. So we are currently dealing with what we're calling the second forest. So if you consider the first forest was um, from you know the very beginning, and then we had that major event of um, human intervention, I'll call it. Um, and we're in the second forest right now that's grown back. And so the the challenge we're facing and and the potential for this to be um, some assumptions to be made incorrectly about age, if all the forest grew back at the same from the same time, those big trees could be the same age as the small trees. And so if you think about how trees grow and needing uh, water and light and, and um, soil nutrients, that means that the bigger trees maybe had a better sight or maybe they were a species that grew faster. But if it's all the same age, we're dealing with a forest that is between 100, is about 120 years old right now. And so if you're cutting big trees and expecting those little trees to grow up and become big, they're all the same age. So they don't have the capacity the capacity for the biological response. So going back, depending to the point question, if it depends on the values of the landowner. We see a lot, especially here in central Pennsylvania, we see a lot of spaces like that where we have a mix of big and small trees that are often the same age. And the big trees are potentially oaks or other good wildlife food. And so this expectation that you can go in and cut these really well-performing trees that have grown well um, maybe may mean that you're removing a species. So I think it's dependent upon site and condition, but but that is why that 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 comment is out there among the forestry community, and that is why um, maybe that's maybe that's spurring that question of cutting only small. It's really it's really may be tied to history. Um, and so, yeah, I'd need, I'd need more information, but, but we'll get there. Very good. Um, next question is, I own four acres of beautiful forest and want to do something very positive for it. Mm -hmm. It's giving me such joy. How can I return something wonderful to the forest? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's incredibly inspirational and aspirational. I think, um, a lot of people really think about forest health um, in, in those kind of spaces and, and, and recognizing the things that could be affecting the overall growth and well-being. So paying attention to declining trees, um, paying attention to uh, invasive plants that are in the area. Um, there are tremendous um, resources and tremendous energies around cultivating small woodlots for wildlife, for pollinators, for birds. And so there's some really neat programs out there that that let you certify habitat your small woodlot as, as habitat. Um, I'm blanking on, I wanna say US Fish and Wildlife, but that may not be quite right. So um, there's a wildlife entity, whether government or a non, non-profit, but they will they will certify your property and just say you know you're doing good things. So focusing on natives, focusing on uh, diversity of species, um, paying attention to forest health those are those are kind of the things that are going to lead to the best outcome over the long over the long run. Great, thank you. Oh, here's a good one. Um, how do we solve deer overbrowsing on a landscape level? <laughs> Uh, in the absence of the reintroduction of major predators, we need more hunters. <laughs> we kind of have to become the the top, the apex predator. Um, yeah, deer have become a real problem, um, and so so that how 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 is that population managed? You know, people had questions, and you know, I'm I'm not the expert here, but would chronic wasting disease be enough to control it? And so far, they've not seen that. Um, uh, level of mortality within the deer population. So there, there are still questions. Um, I had a conversation with a colleague the other day who was, who was talking about deer season where, you know, we're in the middle of archery, uh, rifle starts this, the day after things or the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Um, and so, so the willingness of people to harvest does, um, in addition to about 
you know, we really kind of have to control it. I know there's a lot of energy and investment out there in uh, birth control for deer. There's a lot of energy and investment around um, deer exclosures and just protecting the forest from the deer. And right now that's, that's kind of the, op the best opportunity because we're not able to make those decisions about hunting and the like. And I shouldn't, I, I can't give numbers. I just, I just recognize the challenges of deer. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> more, more hunting. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting to me that uh, it's not just the forests that are being mm -hmm. uh, impacted by deer populations. A lot of our agricultural land is also mm -hmm. uh, severely impacted by large populations of deer. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. There's a there's a cultural challenge there that some of our programs that will support agricultural producers won't extend to forest landowners. Mm. And so that some of those means of control, like harvesting outside seasons, are not extended to the forest like they are at, in agricultural areas. So there's some cultural challenges there too. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, next question. Uh, my small acreage has become fragmented by development all around it over the last four decades. How do I maximize the conservation of habitat for native birds and animals and then consider the conservation of my trees? Yeah, I think um, where I started with the, the first or the second question is probably the best bet. There's been some great um, research coming out of Europe, uh, which is a highly fragmented and heavily developed landscape that is really emphasizing the importance of those small woodlots. Um, there is a program through Penn State Extension, I'll put a plug in, called Woods in Your Backyard that is focused on smaller properties. Um, the, the, it's actually coming up. It starts this January. Uh, I get to be the kickoff speaker, and I, I'll find the date before I, <laughs> before I sign off. But, but there, um, that idea of um, building resources and, and making a plan for, for what um, that could look like and what resources are available to help. So it clicks off January 17th um, and you can find it through Penn State Extension. So I'll just I'll just put that plug out there for you. But there's a great resource, a great resource. And it's very comprehensive. Doug Tallamy has written the foreword. So he's kind of the one everybody knows talking about the importance of birds and the insect population and pollinators. So he's 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 not a presenter, but his he helped write the guide for it. Um, and so there's a great there's a great opportunity there. Okay, another wildlife question. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a grouse hunter and the Rough Grouse Society notes that the suitable habitat is the limiting factor in population for grouse population in PA. Mm -hmm. How do we increase early successional habitat, I assume, to promote grouse populations? Yeah. Yeah, that's a. Um, there have been a lot of efforts in that space, and um, the Audubon Society started something in New England that they called Forestry for the Birds. Um, they've got practice. They're adopting practices down here, and they're training professionals in how to kind of um, manage for creating early successional habitat. Um, so, th so there's some energy there. Um, when you look across the landscape, we haven't seen the results of that energy and investment uh, happening yet, but it's coming. But there's a, there's a large awareness, um, those shocking numbers of declines of birds um, out of the total population that came out a couple of years ago, mil billions of birds that were lost in a very short period of time. Um, I, think, I think that awareness has been raised. Um, I was reading an article the other day about the, um, the influence of hunting organizations in moving more conservation practices forward. So that's the investment of private resources to benefit the public good of the private land, which is kind of an interesting conundrum, but but it's starting to show success in, in many different places. Um, and so so really it's awareness. It's um, it's kind of recognizing the complexity of the system that we're dealing with and um, and why I started with succession and why I was trying to draw those parallels between you know, the different, and I didn't do it very clearly, but the different wildlife that like different things, we just have to be aware of it. We just kind of make some assumptions that it's all a homogenous system and that everything benefits from that homogenous system when it when it's not. It's, it's mm -hmm. a diverse system and we've got to work to cultivate that diversity across the landscape. 
it's a hard message because we're dealing with people who own their peace, who make decisions about their peace, and often don't want to look outside their borders. So how do you, how do you kind of navigate that expectation of property rights and uh, personal obligation to cultivating the larger, the larger good? Um, I, I need, I need philosophers uh, to be part of this with us and eth ethicists and, um, yeah. Um, see how are we doing on time here? We have it. We have a few more minutes of time. Um, question about oak trees. Uh, it, what's happening um, to our oak trees, both I guess in public and private forests? Yeah, we had. Um, we're we're seeing a lot of um, diseases that are native diseases. So, well, diseases, and then we've got an, a non-native but naturalized pest. So, so the so oaks are divided into kind of two subsets. They're the white oaks, um, which include white oak and chestnut oak or rock oak, um, and then the red oaks, which include things like red oak, scarlet oak, uh, black oak, and they have different growth patterns and different processes of of, of creating acorns and 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 re and regenerating, um, and so. There are different things attacking them, but they're attacking them at the same time. And so our red oaks are being faced with oak wilt, um, which has been around for a long time, but we're really starting to see it ramp up. Our white oak our group is being kind of covered, attacked by oak anthracnose, which again has been around for a while, but we're seeing it ramp up. Some of that is our changing moisture re regime. We're seeing more uh, moisture occurring in times that it didn't used to be, which is promoting the fungal growth of those of those two um, diseases. So that's causing some problems. We've also had several years of um, um, spongy moth outbreak, and and we're so we've got this naturalized pest that comes in, and when the population gets to high levels it really negatively impacts. And we see trees that are completely defoliated in the summer. And if they have repeated years of defoliation, they often don't recover. And so we've got some, we've got some threats there. So, so we, when we talk about forest health and forest resilience, we talk about diversity of species and diversity of age. And we try to promote management practices that are going to create those conditions for that diversity across the landscape. So not just managing as one unit, managing as small units, looking at what's currently there, what needs to be promoted within those different areas and trying to get that diversity. And, and that's really what's gonna hold, help us hold the line. Um, but yeah, there's there's kind of some new things coming up or, or, or situations coming up, I'll say, that are making it challenging. Yeah, I, I would imagine that spongy moth defoliation interacts with some of the pathogens to mm. make them more potentially yeah an additional threat a cumulative threat mm -hmm. right so, mm -hmm. um so let's take one of the the q a questions um i think you can relate to this one what challenges if any are that present in forest profession for a female um so so i i started my career um in forest industry. I worked for Georgia Pacific in Southern Arkansas. I'm from Arkansas, so that wasn't the biggest deal <laughs> down there. Um, and it, it was an interesting, there, It's and it's still kind of an interesting space um, to, to engage in. And, and um, not from any potent, uh, purposefully exclusionary tactics, but more just familiarity. Um, you know, a lot of landowners have expectation about who a forester is and what a forester could look like. And so um, there are often opportunities to engage in some different ways. Uh, and and one of the things that's happening right now that I'm I'm really excited about and 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 doing my part to cultivate as a, a later career person in this space. There's some real big shifts happening as we recognize the challenge of the forest. I mentioned how much was degraded. There's a new emphasis on restoration. And so there's there's been significant investment in programs and there's been significant investment in um, cultivating people who 
have a different kind of understanding or a different kind of engagement. And so there's there's new opportunity. And so we're working really hard to diversify the profession and and kind of cultivate that awareness and um and and kind of support those who are coming after us. I, yeah, I don't I don't have anything specific that I that I yeah would want to share here, but um but yeah, there's there's ample opportunity and I would encourage it because there's a there's a different engagement point happening and it's it's kind of exciting to think about than maybe it was even when I started my career 20, 30 years ago. Great. Thank you. Um this is a question I'm interested in as well. Uh, and and um, we hear a lot about controlled fires in, in many Western states. Uh, mm -hmm. The question that was submitted is, how do you use controlled fire in Pennsylvania forest types or yeah. do we use controlled yeah. fire? Well, so, so our current forest that grew back from that uh, absence of forest between 1890 and 1910 was subject to fire. I, I was talking about the fires that moved across the landscape. Well, that created conditions for oak. That created conditions for fire adapted species. So, so mm. the present forest that we have came back from that significant fire, those significant fire events at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so, so when you're looking at oak, um, there's been a lot of research about the importance of fire within that landscape to um, to really give those oak the competitive advantage over the other things. In the absence of fire, we're talking about a lot of the, it's called the mesification of forests. So it's, it's we're seeing more species that can't tolerate fire. Um, and and some of those species have different characteristics, maybe different wildlife value or even different economic or social value. Um, so fire could be an important part of our landscape. Now, our laws are such that right now it is very difficult for a private landowner to use fire on a landscape in Pennsylvania. Now, I see that we've got folks from other states and that are have more opportunities, but it depends upon the species that you're trying to regenerate. It depends upon the forest that you're trying to um, get established. And so it is a tool. It is one of many tools. And sometimes it is the best tool. But there also may be stipulations where it can't be used. And so um, I know a lot of people would like to see more fire in the landscape and, and regulatorily, we've got some uh, cha challenges in our state. Um, and I, I know there are important things to consider. I started my career in a place where there were a lot of fires and uh, a lot of arson fires and a lot of wildfires. And it was uh, it was an interesting space to occupy. <laughs> um. I think we are kind mm. of close to the end of our time mm -hmm. uh, and maybe time to wrap things up. I, I want to thank again, Allison, for joining us today and, and for your great presentation and, and conversation. Um, very, very uh, useful information. And um, I appreciate the attendance and, and interest of all our guests as well. Um, just to wrap things up here, today's session marks the final College Connections of 2023. We want to thank all of you who have joined us today and in the many other webinars we've hosted since we started this series during the COVID-19 pandemic back in 2021. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed the insider look into just some of the outstanding programs and people and priorities uh, that, that are going on within our college. And um, so, so please, we hope you all stay tuned for future opportunities to connect and engage with the college um, both virtually and in person, as we work to highlight the incredible work that that goes on in the College of Agricultural Sciences at, at Penn State. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Allison, one more time, and, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks so much.